Welcome to the 20th in a series of 20 devotionals in the Lent in Art devotional series. In this devotional, there are two basic parts. The first is called the reading. Every painting tells a story and there is a need to read the meaning. In this part of the devotional, Kelly provides background that will help you to read the painting. The second part is the contemplation. Kelly will give you some guidance, but she really wants you to engage with the painting and the underlying story and let it speak to you. We cover 20 paintings in the whole devotional. The subject for this video is a painting entitled Anastasis of Cora Church and is a part of a series of frescoes and mosaics that decorate the interior of the church and were done between 1315 and 1321 by various and unknown artists. Thanks for joining us on this tour of Lenten art, and here's Kelly. So far in our series, we have focused on Western art, which generally means Catholic art during the Renaissance. Today, we are moving east to what was the center of the Orthodox Church in the Middle Ages, specifically to Istanbul, Turkey. The Church of the Holy Savior in Kora was a medieval Byzantine Greek Orthodox Church. Over its long history, it has been converted into a mosque and is now a museum. Kora is translated country or field. In the early 4th century, the church was part of a monastery built outside of the walls of Constantinople, hence the designation of a church in the fields or the country. In the late 5th century, the walls were rebuilt and the church was included within the walls. However, the name remained. Undergoing several building programs, the building as it exists today was largely done in the 11th century, with the interior decorations completed between 1315 and 1321. The interior of the church is decorated with frescoes and mosaics that were endowed or paid for by the powerful statesman Theodore Mitokidis. While we do not know the names of any of the artists who were employed, we can appreciate the devotional nature of their work. I am always awed by the beauty of these old churches. The prospect of painting frescoes or building mosaics on the domed ceilings without any of the modern conveniences we have at our disposal is impressive. Much of the interior of the church is covered in frescoes or paintings that are done directly onto wet plaster. Then, as the plaster dries, the paint literally becomes part of the wall. The mosaics are also formed in wet plaster. We are extremely fortunate that such permanent methods were used to decorate the interior of this church. Following the fall of the city to the Ottoman Empire in 1453, the church was converted into a mosque. As Islam prohibits iconic images, the mosaics and frescoes were covered, either with wooden shutters or a layer of plaster. That and frequent earthquakes has damaged the artwork, but due to the nature of the works, a great deal of it could be restored. In 1948, the building was the object of an extensive restoration program. Two Americans, Thomas Whitmore and Paul Underwood, from two institutes of Byzantine studies, oversaw the restoration, and in 1958, the Cora Church became a museum, one of the finest surviving examples of Byzantine art. We're going to be looking in a work in the apse of the church that is in a side funerary chapel. The painting is called An Anastasis. While the subject matter is still the resurrection of Christ, the representation and elements included are different than those of the Western Church's resurrection paintings and provide us with different themes to consider in our meditation time. In this painting, we see Christ in resplendent, brilliant white robes standing in the center, reaching for two other figures. Christ is surrounded by a white mandorla with gold stars. A mandorla is an architectural device used to make a ring of brightness around Christ to denote holiness. Mandorlas are traditionally an arch with a pointed top, as we see here. The mandorla shape reminds us of the cave that Christ was buried in, recalling to our minds the path he took to reach this moment in time. The stars that line the mandorla encourage us to think of heaven, even though Christ is currently standing on the gates of hell. The two broken pieces of wood under Christ are the gates of hell, and they have been shattered by Christ's death. We can see in the blackness that is under his feet, there are scattered locks and keys, as all of the doors of hell have been opened. There is a figure that is struggling on the gate, and that is Satan, who has been bound. 
an opposite picture to the locks and keys which have been opened. Satan has been bound up. With Christ's death, men are no longer locked in death, despair, and hell. They are freed. And with Christ's death, Satan's power and influence are broken, bound up, and rendered impotent. On either side of Christ are two sarcophagi. Christ is pulling Adam out of one and Eve out of the other. Eve is pictured in a flowing red robe to reference the blood of Christ which is freeing her. Adam is painted in white, a picture of the blood of Christ washing him clean, white as snow. Adam and Eve are representative of all of humankind. With them man fell and has suffered the effects of death. Here Christ extends his hands of grace and pulls them, and by extension the human race, out of the tomb. On the far left and far right of the pictures are others that Christ is gathering to himself. Those who have been identified are to the left King David, King Solomon, and John the Baptist, and on the right is Abel leading a line of saints and martyrs. There is a long church tradition that on Silent Saturday, or the day before Easter, Christ descended to gather to himself those who had died before his crucifixion and resurrect them with him. There is debate about how to frame this descent, but the word descend is used repeatedly both in scripture and in church creeds. In the Orthodox Church, resurrection art commonly emphasizes this theme of Christ descending. It is portrayed as a glorious event, with victorious Christ breaking down the gates of hell, trampling Satan underfoot, and raising those who believe with him, and it is from the gates of hell that Christ begins his resurrection. The emphasis is on the fact that Christ's work is completed, and sin's hold on humankind has been broken. Here are two verses that reference this idea and frame the context for a painting. 1 Peter 3, 18 and 19. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits. Ephesians 4, 9 through 10. When he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean, except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens, in order to fill the whole universe. As we've alluded to earlier, this painting is just one of a larger cycle of paintings. In our modern context, we think of individual works of art as standalone paintings. This was not the way churches were designed or decorated in either the Middle Ages or the Renaissance. The core church has a dual dedication. Churches were dedicated to a particular saint and their stories would play a part in the decoration of the church. Cora Church is dedicated to both Christ and the Virgin Mary. The theological underpinnings of this dedication is the interconnectedness of the Incarnation and Salvation. Throughout the Church, there are many different cycles or series of stories, and each of them emphasizes how the themes of Christ's Incarnation through the Virgin Mary is connected to the story of salvation. There is a reconciliation of these two opposing forces, the giving of life at the nativity with the taking of life at the crucifixion. The ultimate reconciliation is in our painting of the resurrection. The balance that is struck on a multitude of levels when one experiences the entire church's art is profound. Incarnation and salvation contrasted, compared, and explored over and over again in a variety of ways throughout the church. One specific way that this balance is struck that is unique to Korah is gender symmetry. Christ and Mary are presented in paired images throughout, signifying both genders' participation in the fall of man and both genders' participation in the salvation of man. Although both Christ and Mary are present at the nativity and the crucifixion, generally Mary is to remind us of Christ taking on flesh in the incarnation and Christ is the ever-present reminder of the divine loving us enough to sacrifice his life. Just one example of this visual pairing is the complementary images of the Virgin Mary holding the infant Christ, a common image in churches. In other paintings at Cora, however, this image is reversed, with Christ holding a swaddled Mary's soul in the picture of her death. In the first painting, we see Mary as the vehicle to bring Christ to the earth. 
and in the latter we see Christ as the vehicle to take Mary back to heaven. Echoing what is a constant thread running through the core church, in our painting we have Christ pulling Adam and Eve from their tombs, another example of gender symmetry. Just as Christ is the vehicle to take Mary to heaven, here Christ is the agent of resurrection for both Adam and Eve. The imagery also calls to mind that the Virgin Mary is often referred to as the second Eve, as through her obedience she brought salvation to the world, similar to how Christ is the second Adam, repairing the damage done by the first Adam. This sophisticated intellectual argument presented in the cycles of the church was appealing to Mariochetus, who was funding the decoration of the church. Considered the leading thinker of his era, he wanted the cycles of the church to not just be visually satisfying, but to challenge the mind as well. Each painting, including the one we are viewing, can be read on many different levels, from the obvious storytelling, to the movements of the Byzantine liturgy, to the allusions to the Old Testament, and then uniting those themes with their fulfillment in the resurrection and last judgment. On the Cora Church's website, the church's art is described like this. It is as sophisticated and erudite as a work of contemporary Byzantine literature, structured as a vast epic poem. I love the pairing of the incarnation with the crucifixion. I've always been humbled by the thought that Christ took on flesh. There is another image at Cora Church of the Virgin Mary as the Ark of the Covenant. Images where Mary is painted with Christ inside of her. These images are meant to be a visual portrayal of the concept that Mary was a container for the uncontainable. Those images in that phrase emphasize the idea wrapped up in the incarnation. Those concepts reach their culmination in Christ's final sacrifice on the cross. Here we have an image of just what that sacrifice accomplished the trampling of the gates of hell, the binding of Satan, and the resurrecting, not just himself, but those who are his. This painting is a reminder that there is nowhere we can go from God's presence, nowhere that he won't pursue relationship with us, even if that is to the depths of Sheol. In a few moments, I will read a portion of Psalm 139. I think it is fitting when we consider the resurrection and what it has accomplished to consider the lengths to which Christ has gone to pursue fellowship with us. Wherever we find ourselves in life, Christ wishes to come beside us and to offer us life. If the offer of eternal life feels a bit abstract, or if the thought of Christ pursuing you to Sheol is something you can't grab a hold of, I'll offer these words from Pope Benedict's Introduction to Christianity, which I came across while researching the core church. This article thus asserts that Christ strode through the gate of our final loneliness, that in his passion he went down into the abyss of our abandonment, where no voice can reach us any longer. There is he. As we contemplate this fresco and consider how we can more fully emulate Christ, I'm struck that we are also called to stride into others' places of loneliness, where they may feel abandoned and unheard. Like Christ, we are to pursue and come alongside those in need of Christ's saving presence. Psalm 139 You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me, and the light will become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being, 
You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. I love you, Baba.